The court has testimony that you practice reckless or violent behavior. A public event, a funeral this month, any of that hold water? I wasn't violent. I wasn't violent. I was upset for sure. I lost somebody I love, but I wasn't violent. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowlane. Each episode of the Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We're at episode 96, back to Cole's choice. What are we going to be discussing today? Well, before we get into the film, I have a couple of things that I wanted to mention up front. Usually we save the housekeeping for the end, but we have some big news that I wanted to share right away. We are partnering with our friend Aaron West over at Criterion Now and Criterion Close Up, and we are launching our own podcast network. It's called The 25th Frame, and it's all about celebrating film and culture worldwide. We realized that after doing this for some years now, we've built a great community of like-minded friends and film lovers that are out there doing some fantastic work, and we wanted to bring them all together under one umbrella so that we could amplify each other's voices and be there to provide resources and support. The lineup is really strong coming out of the gate, and as we grow, we hope to add even more passionate and diverse voices to this. And if you want to keep up with all this as it develops, please go check out the website, 25thframemedia.com, and that's with the numerals 25, 25th. The whole roster is there, and we are constantly refining and adding to what's available as we are beginning to launch the site. The other big news is that we have our 100th episode coming up, and we wanted to celebrate the folks that listen to the show, so we are turning the reins of the show over to you. For the first time, the listeners are going to decide what film we're going to cover, and for the next several weeks we'll be taking suggestions and assembling them for a final poll to determine our subject. So go to our Twitter, our Facebook group, or just send us an email and let us know what movie you would most like to hear us talk about, and eventually that last film standing will get the Magic Lantern treatment. Also in this episode, we're going to devote some time to listener questions, sort of an ask us anything. So if there is stuff that you're curious to know about us and the show, send it along and we'll try to answer as many as we can. I am really looking forward to seeing what everyone comes up with. Okay, I just threw a lot of stuff at you, so I want to repeat. Typically, we don't do films that are this recent, so I just wanted to make sure we reiterated our spoiler warning. If you haven't seen the film, go watch it and come back if that's important to you, because from this point on, we're getting into detail. And that film is Thunder Road from 2018, directed and written by Jim Cummings, who also stars in it, along with Kendall Farr, Nikon Robinson, Jocelyn DeBear, Chelsea Edmondson, and Lantern favorite Macon Blair. It's about a police officer who's beginning to break down after a divorce, the ensuing custody battle, and his mother's death. Appropriately enough, and maybe for more than any film that we've seen in a long time, we just need to get right into this opening scene, right? It's so pivotal. And I think we take our cue from the film itself. No intro, no credits, no DVD menu even to get started with. It starts right away. This is really hard for me to not reflexively give it proportionately more weight than the other scenes, since this is how I saw the material first. For the last two years... This opening scene was Thunder Road, as we knew it. The whole project began as this 12-minute short film that is recreated with one significant difference for the opening of the feature. We find ourselves at the funeral of Officer Jim Arno's mother, where he is delivering an increasingly unbalanced eulogy captured in a single beautiful long take. We're trying to keep up with him as his grief-stricken brain ricochets from fond reverie to guilt to interpretive dance and back again. Now, he gives us a lot of information in this tribute to her. Did anything in particular resonate with you here? 
There are so many things, and it's difficult not to want to talk about every single one of them because, as you mentioned, starting as a short film, the entire world is right here, and we're wondering what kind of world would this be? We start from the back of the room, and we get this slow tracking shot into Jim. And it feels like, at least for me, that most of the time our attention is completely on him. We're not thinking about the rest of the people in the funeral or anyone sitting in the pews. It's all about him, his mannerisms, how massively awkward this is going to get, and thinking about what it is that he's saying. It struck me with those brilliant screenplay choices like Go Tigers said with a shrug and a head shake, or any who, or typical, that he doesn't really know how to express himself. He seems to be trying to make things more palatable for who he thinks is listening. And I'm also taking him at face value that he really has understood at this point that he didn't appreciate or understand what he had. And then, of course, the big moment, working through the song Thunder Road. Yeah, a lot of things stick in my head for one reason or another, the most pertinent being her work as a dance instructor and how important that was to her and the way it filters through to him and his decision to memorialize her this way. That dance is a decision that will have significant repercussions, fair or unfair, throughout the rest of the movie. There are a number of things tied to that dance and that song that are echoed all the way through until the very last word of the very last scene, practically. Then you have the other little things. The fact that no siblings came, so all this responsibility falls on him. Depending on your perception or your family dynamics, this can be heartbreaking and a heavy burden for him to bear. The way he hits the certified part of certified public accountant. Anything to add some glamour to her existence in this dead-end town. His digression about the girl at school who bit everyone. His questioning whether or not he has to leave when the funeral director approaches him. That's my favorite part. There is a lot of great character work in a short span of time. We get insight into what he finds valuable. His self-awareness or lack thereof and his willingness to commit to doing what he perceives as the right thing, no matter how ill-conceived it is. It's compelling as an opener, too, I think, because we're not sure if this is happening only because his head might be swimming in the specific way that grief does to you. If we don't know this character very well, maybe he's not like this all the time. These can be extreme circumstances for someone to deal with, and they may be behaving well out of character. You mentioned that he's occasionally overcome remembering how he treated his mother. How much of that, though, is just the intensity of the moment? I think it's fitting at that juncture that the thing that allows him to go on is the motherly reassurance that he gets from the funeral director. It's something that we'll learn that he needs desperately in a lot of ways. We'll see that repeated where he'll take something from someone who is in any way an authority figure as a way to justify or make him feel better for what he's done. He bounces back with that anywho, and that gives us our first undeniable indication that this is going to be as funny as it is traumatic. The big divergence, though, from the original short comes when he does this performance of Thunder Road. In the original short, he was accompanied by the Bruce Springsteen song on a boombox. And it is something to behold, I think, as far as the short went. I really think that having the song put the exclamation point on the public breakdown, but in a way that was easy to have sympathy for, and that also simultaneously conveyed the most of his mother's unspoken story. In this feature-length version, he tries to play the song, but he fails at that too, and it certainly engenders a different kind of horrified response to him just silently acting out this manic episode. All you can hear is his breathing and his shuffling while everyone just sits there, quietly stunned and mortified for him. You were familiar with the short beforehand, right? You saw it. Yes, you showed it to me. So how did you feel this change worked? I think it is nothing short of brilliant, and that's for a couple of reasons. I didn't have a super strong opinion going in that somehow that was going to make or break the film. Now, before we watched it, did you know that that was going to be the case? I did not. Me neither. It came as a complete surprise. So let me tell you a little bit more about how the song came to be in the short in the first place and why it's not in the film. So in the short film, 
He made that completely without permission. They used the song without permission. He really didn't think it would do any more than become basically a viral video at most. So at that point, he spent a long time trying to get in touch with Bruce Springsteen, going through all of these pathways. He wrote an open letter. So it's the classic tried and true indie filmmaking path of better to apologize afterwards than ask permission before. It is, and it worked, because one of Bruce's lawyers saw it, showed it to Bruce, and he felt really favorably about it. He said, this kid's on a roll. So essentially, they got lucky. They spent a small amount of money and were able to use it in the short that we know now. For the film instead, he decided to shoot it two ways, with the song, without the song. And he felt ultimately that if you front-loaded that fulfillment at the beginning, you might end up losing some people. Also, and here's where I think it gets really brilliant. He thought that if the song was in the feature, it would just be basically a short film opening the movie. And without it, it takes it to this incredibly, deeply humiliating level that you wouldn't feel if the song had been left in. And I think that you get the sense why his daughter doesn't want to hang out with him and why he has to then set about and try to regain some of this dignity. It's really apples and oranges for me. I love it in the short. And I think I may always have a slightly greater affinity for it in that way that the first record you hear from a band always remains your favorite of theirs. That is not to say the other way does not work. In the larger context of the film, I really like it, though you still have to know the song to truly understand. I think that's the point. And I'm one of those people who doesn't know the song very well. And so if I'm sitting there in that funeral parlor listening to this, I've got no connection to this guy. I've got no way to try to translate those words into a deeper meaning for his mother's life. So not knowing it, by the time you get to the end, are you still aware of how important its absence is and how it reverberates through the story? I think so. I mean, that ending really pays off. It must have been a hard decision to make. I'm definitely glad I have both options to think about. Now, this seems to share a lot, at least on the surface for me, with our last selection, Happy Go Lucky, in that the narrative here is also cumulative rather than causal. How does this feel for you? Is this cohesive? Is it more a series of loosely linked vignettes? Something else? I find it to be very cohesive, maybe because more and more I understand where he's coming from. Even if that person is not me, I do know what it feels like to be on the edge much of the time. I know that that is a criticism leveled at the film, or at least something that people feel. But I think a lot about Ben Wheatley's film Kill List, which we talked about in 2018's jack o lantern episode. Mm. Everything seems to build. There are still surprises. But once we get to the end, I think we understand how we got there. And it makes everything that came before make so much more sense. And essentially have that much more weight. And it causes me to think about things, which I appreciate. I think there are a number of scenes that are indicative of Cummings' background making short films, but that's a plus for me. It just means that I know that in these scenes, there's likely more attention to detail, more thorough characterization. If you're accustomed to and adept at having to make a coherent and complete statement in 7 to 12 minutes, chances are good that what other filmmakers would consider transitional, in this case, can stand successfully on its own. It's the quality of the connective tissue, I think, that makes a considerable difference also. The little things in between elevated above just being a series of tragic comic sketches. In fact, a lot of the time, I enjoyed those little moments so much that I wish that they were longer. In particular, there's a foot chase of a suspect that culminates in his apprehension in a woman's backyard where she's trying to hit him with her shoe. I wanted a much longer interaction between Arnaud and that lady once the other cops went away. Their brief interaction seemed to have so much potential energy in it. I think it shows you the quality of his casting and the people that he uses around him. I want to talk for a second about the music itself, not just Thunder Road or the lack thereof. Great, because I think it's pretty crucial to the tone of this chase scene and probably contributes a little bit to that feeling I have of wanting more from this small bit. It didn't occur to me the first time I watched it. It was only in reading more about it and how he made most of it, which is a thing I think you would especially appreciate. 
You mean as a musician he made, he composed and performed? Yes, quite a bit of it. That it really came back to me, oh yeah, I remember that even if I didn't focus on it at the time. For example, in that big first scene, it's the organ that opens and closes. And that was the organ in his mother and father's house. And he was playing around with it, doing some simple chords, and then he thought, this sounds good. He recorded it on the voice memo app. <laughs> And then he cut it on a plane. And then the chase sequence, he did a number of the instruments for that. He plays the ukulele in a scene coming up later in the film that I know you'll remember. So it's pretty dang cool. He's obviously thinking about this so clearly from start to finish. Well, I think the sequence where he picks up his partner is a great example of how these small moments work in concert with the larger ones. And they give us the entire picture of who he is. On his way to work, he is picking up his partner, Nate, who could not make it to the funeral. And he's clearly hurt by that, but he won't admit it. I think also, tell me if you agree, there's a big part that is relieved that Nate didn't see what happened. There's that. There's also, reading between the lines, the fact that we know Nate didn't really want to go, I don't think. But he does what good people do. He brings food. Very Southern. I assume Southern. I don't know. People up North may do that as well, but I think of it as a very Southern thing that we do. Yeah, I think all those people up North are just cold hearted. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we're not being charitable enough. They do know their way around a hot dish. It's true. Well, after he picks him up, they answer this drunk and disorderly call in the parking lot of the Crestview Minimax, which is kind of fun for me to see because I literally used to live two blocks from where they are shooting this. And I walked down there on almost a daily basis. Shout out to the little deli. True story. You were that guy, right? <laughs> no, that was not based on my life story. But I could have just as easily been sitting on one of the picnic tables out there and watched that as it went down. Suffice it to say, things do not go well. He's not fit. He's clearly not in the right frame of mind to be doing this job. And he gets sent home, which is where he should have been anyway. That part where he gets so aggressive with this guy who's in the parking lot yelling and spitting, and the other cops and the captain are there to pull him off and send him on his way. I don't know quite how to characterize his reaction. It's that same instance that we've been seeing of, I'm fine, I'm fine, everything's fine. He just has no guile whatsoever. It seems like an athlete who reveres a coach and has no confidence in himself and certainly no ego. I'm not sure about the ego thing exactly, but I definitely see what you mean in terms of how everything about him is about external validation. And we see both in this moment in the car with Nate and then in front of his colleagues in this tense moment on the job, he is flailing in every possible way. It's painful how desperately he is trying to save face, and it's simultaneously crushingly funny in the way that his captain will not allow it. And that's completely for his own good. He's neither able to connect with the people that care about him in any meaningful, intimate way, nor grasp the gravity of his larger situation. His personal circumstances have him unmoored from everything and everyone, macro and micro, and it only looks like it's going to get worse. Now, how long did it take you to get a handle on the tone of this film? I feel like watching the short film helped a bit. I knew I was going to see really funny things and genuinely sad things. And most importantly, I think I got the sense, like with the character, that Jim Cummings in general is also a person who doesn't have a lot of guile. I think what you see is what you get. I don't feel like he's faking it there on screen. So in the film, I think it was just the first couple of minutes, or maybe even right away. And then definitely at that first big laugh that I had when he asked, do I have to leave in that high-pitched voice as he's still comforting his daughter. I think it took me a little bit longer, even being familiar with the short. There's a lot here to unpack in terms of just our response to the trailer, I think. How we felt about it initially, where we come down on it now in relation to the film, there's a lot to be said about perception, expectation, and eye of the beholder. I think I had expectations set up by the trailer that did a little bit of a disservice to the film. Its comedy is so specific, and it takes time to match your rhythm to it, especially if you were expecting something else. In retrospect, now having seen it, it feels a little ironic to me that I was initially attracted specifically because of the trailer, which I ultimately think misrepresents it a little. 
at least the one we saw. I was responding to what I saw as the vulnerability of the character. It's been kind of a rough year for me, in case you don't know. And my mental health and what I was feeling at the time when I first saw the trailer, I was connecting to that man on the precipice part of things. But that wasn't what you were seeing at all, right? You saw much more of the comedy of it than I did at first blush, but it wasn't comedy that I think you had confidence in. Like it might be manipulative, lazy, insincere in some way. I don't remember there being a ton of comedy in the trailer. I remember that vulnerable aspect, but being told that it was incredibly funny and that it was a big comedy. So it felt like those two things weren't going to go together, especially with the parts that they were showing me. So I guess, now that we're at the end of it, it maybe does seem like they did the best they could with capturing the tone in that trailer because it is really funny and it is really hard to describe. And I was really worried going into this. I was afraid that I wasn't going to like it, that it would seem, as you were saying, insincere, that it was going to be a put on job by this guy and I was supposed to laugh at him for all the wrong reasons. So the trailer worked for me very specifically, but it gave you reservations and we both think it was a little misleading, but maybe not now that we're talking about it. Maybe it captured it and we just didn't know how well. I think so. It's hard to then think, well, what would they have done to really capture the tone? I think we're feeling it in two drastically different directions at that time, probably. But we're glad it turned out that those initial impressions that we gleaned from the trailer were at least somewhat wrong in the right ways. So what pulled it back from the brink of preciousness or disingenuousness for you? I think it's all the care that he took to write this, to then act it to the very, very best of his or anyone's ability, to direct himself doing it, to find the best people that he could work with, and to give them the best environment they could have to act and produce this thing. I think if he had created a character that I absolutely hated, or didn't want to see somehow try to do his best or be better than he knew he could be, while essentially being on his side the whole time, if that character wasn't in place, I couldn't go along with any of this. So you're firmly in the camp of, this is a good guy. Because Cummings has described this as a sort of worst-case scenario autobiography for him. And the film is obviously affectionate toward the character. It sounds like you think he deserves that. Even though he lets people down a lot, especially when he doesn't mean to. He tells that story about breaking and entering in front of his partner's family that's inadvertently embarrassing to Nate. He catches this girl in the parking lot outside of Dillard's, which is a perfect detail, by the way. Not Sears, not J.C. Penney, Dillard's. She's with two real slickers. The effort that went into their production aside, you feel like this character is a good person. I think yes, and we mentioned that parking lot scene earlier when they're on the call for that yelling and spitting guy. He's also pulled off not just for his own good, but for the public's good. We can't forget, this guy is a cop. Especially he's in uniform for the bulk of the film until he is no longer a cop. So everything is stacked against him, and he is still on the hook for all of this. Everything hurts him more than anybody else. How sympathetic can we be, though, if that's all because of what he does? He brings that upon himself, right? I think the key is... He's always doing what he thinks is right. That sense that he should intervene in moments, like the girl in the mall parking lot. But it's always about not actually being asked for help or being asked to do the thing that he is doing. But it's still a good thing. Like before this scene in the mall parking lot, we have this week where he has been forced out of work. And this is his sort of getting his life together. And because this isn't an ordinary film, it's all completely desperate and not rousing. No one has asked him to do any of these things, and yet he is doggedly doing them. And back to this mall parking lot scene. It's all in service to others. It's not his professional gain or personal gain. It is, I think, first and foremost, to do the right thing. And I think that scene ends beautifully. He's giving her a good piece of advice, something a lot of us could follow. And it's another person who does not say thank you, but she does follow the tip. I might quibble a little bit about his motivations. It does work out for everyone's benefit in the long run. 
but I don't quite see it the same way. I don't think he can leave his baggage at the door. He obviously sees his daughter in this girl, and because of it, he's at least a little out of line. He's taking this personally, if possibly also doing the right thing. I felt like he did that for himself, to make himself feel better, that it did little to nothing for her. And you can guarantee that this will mean no boys for Crystal. I think you've made a great point, and I don't really disagree with you. I guess I'm thinking more about that cumulative effect. But also, you don't always know the thing that you're going to do that might save someone in a different way. And we do see that play out in several instances. And I think what's on his mind is those people that he couldn't save. I think I also see it in a slightly different way because I can put myself in that girl's place. We may diverge a little bit on that too, because to me, on paper, his need to put himself at the center of things could be a wholly unappealing trait, but that's tempered a little bit because it's so obviously rooted in his need to be loved. The way that the women in his orbit have shaped his life is significant, and the ways in which that he has been unable to completely connect with them is like a perpetual motion machine. His damage and the way he behaves makes it so that they can't or won't give him the things he needs, which only continues the pattern on this disintegrating loop. All of his family dynamics demonstrate this in one way or another. Mother, ex-wife, daughter, sister. He's constantly fighting against and creating this estrangement simultaneously. It also raises questions of inheritance versus environment, too. There's a great detail that's almost invisible, but speaks volumes about this rudderless, rootless feeling that I associate with him. And that's the band that holds his sunglasses, specifically the fact that they are branded LSU. Viewing it from the surface, it probably doesn't mean much to you. Maybe this guy is just a fan of a particular sports team. But if you have a certain set of experiences, I think it points to something larger. I see this guy as someone that was forced out of his home by Hurricane Katrina, that landed in Austin, adopted it as his hometown, but can never be satisfied with that somehow. I was in Austin when that happened, and I worked with someone that that happened to. In fact, he since moved on to your neck of the woods, Boise. This character, though, carries that around with him all the time, and I think it's a brilliant choice that it's a sunglass strap as opposed to some other memento, because it's as close to an albatross as you can get. Every day when he wakes up, he literally puts this yoke on himself. I think that LSU detail is really interesting as well, and there are a couple of examples of him denigrating his intelligence and using LSU sort of as the totem for that. Making a joke of it. I think of somebody who whether in truth or in fear, that was the only place that they chose to go to or applied to. He takes that opportunity to make fun of himself because I think he thinks someone else will. And so he also seems to be signaling to himself all the time, this is the best I could have done. You're right, though, in the general assessment of his character, all of this never stops him from trying, trying to do the right thing. For example, no matter how contentious things with his ex-wife are, we never doubt that his daughter means more to him than anything. His scenes with Kendall Farr are my favorite. They feel the most honest for two reasons for me. One, there is the least amount of those things that seem to get in the way of his other interactions and relationships. And I think you can chalk that up to a number of things. Maybe he doesn't feel the need to protect his ego the same way with her. Maybe it's just because his arrested emotional development means that she is closest to his wavelength. With her budding adolescent concerns, they're like two kids together, almost. The other reason it feels so honest is that he makes me truly believe that his survival might literally depend on it. You see this relief when instinct kicks in and he's able to pull off this hand clap game. The way everything else in his life is crumbling before his eyes, if he loses this, it might be the end of him. And at the end of that scene, I can feel how hard his heart is beating. I think that character is written really well, too. It seems incredibly appropriate that everything she does is just a shrug and a sigh. Everything's wrong. Nothing could possibly please her. Now, are you basing this on your own experiences as a dissatisfied pre-adolescent? Ages 0 to 39. <laughs> yeah, I was a dick. It was terrible. I was terrible. I really like as well, and this could be me reading too much in this, 
I think he desperately needs her to provide all the love in the world. He's got no other outlet for it anymore, no other opportunity where it can come from. So he needs her unconditional love, and it is not going to be forthcoming. I also get the sense, tell me what you think, that maybe he thinks or realizes that she's possibly smarter than he is. I definitely feel that because obviously we know that he has suffered from the learning disability. So it's a combination of knowing that already and maybe fearing or suspecting that whatever is good in her came from his ex-wife. Yeah, I think fear and suspect are good word choices. And he may or may not be onto something. I think this is his own insecurity. I also think you're right on the money with he has an opportunity to not have any ego here, but mostly I think she wouldn't allow him to have one. She's known him her whole life, after all. She sees through everything. And I agree, Kendall Farr here is great. He had looked at a number of young actresses, and she was the one who just felt like his daughter, the one he could relate to, that they had the best rapport with, and I think that comes out. Yeah, we should underline, it's not all grief and trauma. It's full of these equally brilliant left-field comic moments, tender moments. It's actually a little difficult to convey how funny they are, because they are such an odd combination of precise language and chaotic delivery. Just the elasticity of Cummings' physical comedy. Every time she gets out of the car, there is this spewing geyser of last-second questions, paternal instruction, and desperate affection. This balancing act of cutting remarks and what he thinks passes for civility. When he is served with divorce papers, that whole phone call is a bit of genius. And then we have one of our favorites, Macon Blair. He's Crystal's teacher, and he's asked for this meeting because she's being disruptive. And even though it's a fairly short scene, once again, Macon Blair proves himself to be one of the best actors of his generation. It must be such a joy to sit down across from him to do this kind of work. His empathy is a gift, and his comic timing is impeccable. And both are on display here. I like that moment again where he holds on so tightly to something that the teacher says. Again, this person in a position of authority whom he trusts and looks up to even though he's also filled with rage at the same time, that they'll form a united front against this problem behavior. Macon is just a riot, as he is gingerly trying to explain the expletives that Crystal is using in class. And then, almost in the same breath, he has to exert some control as things get testy when this learning disability is brought up. That is an incredibly defeating moment. His reaction to Cummings' reaction to that he does more just by widening his eyes slightly than a dozen actors could do, given the entire spotlight. Macon Blair is always going to be the anchor, the MVP for me. Won't just marry him if you love him <laughs> so much. Oh, wait, we're already married. And hey, happy anniversary. Thanks. Well, the scene with Crystal's teacher is not an outlier. He really does not do well in any situation where it would be best to keep your cool. When he meets his counsel for these divorce proceedings, for instance... She advises him, don't say anything you don't have to, which we know is not exactly his strong suit. During these court proceedings, the funeral comes up again, and it catches him by surprise. And I know his behavior at the funeral was unconventional, but would you really call that violent or reckless? I would never call it that. What do people see when they look at this man that I don't? Do you think of that moment in his life as violent or reckless, or is it just vulnerability amplified to the point that people can't bear to look at it and they just want it taken away. I think he has no concept of the right moment to let his guard down. The right moment is not in court, even when the judge is being friendly. The right moment is not in the funeral home when you're wearing your uniform and you proceed to, yes, act recklessly. Maybe I just have a different connotation for that, because to me that conjures up images of him endangering someone or himself, and I didn't get that from it at all. So let's say that we're out somewhere in public or a solemn event of some kind, and you see a cop start to do interpretive dance, run <laughs> off at the mouth, okay. cry, laugh, say weird things all over the place. Are you not thinking, whoa, but maybe this guy should not have a gun? But it's his mom. Of course it is. We're giving him the benefit of the doubt. The judge is not in a position to do that. 
I mean, clearly, we want to see him succeed. We don't want to see him lose his daughter. But if you are watching this video completely out of context, it's got to seem like at least he maybe has a screw loose or has a problem for which he needs help. But I mean, also at the end of the day, the world doesn't generally reward behavior like this, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and it's a damn shame, I feel like. That connective tissue that I talked about earlier, the part between the tragedy and the comedy that all makes this work, I feel like, is this vulnerability. You see it a little bit in the moments where he's finally confiding in Nate that nothing is working, when he engages in some self-assessment. Now bear in mind, what he is just arriving at, what he is just now able to say, has been obvious to everyone else for a while now, especially Nate. Nate's pretty crucial to the film, I think, actually. It's not a huge role, but it's pivotal. His partner is there, looking out for him, throwing that funeral footage phone into the lake, knowing when to be there and when not to be there as a friend. We talked about how great it is to have Macon Blair as a scene partner, and you can definitely say the same thing about Nike and Robinson. I took a page out of your book and was watching this with the sound off. Since so much is happening in Jim Cummings' eyes and facial expressions, I wanted to pay close attention to that, but then... I started to notice something in Nike and Robinson. Watch how closely Nate regards Jim's face at all times. It makes sense on one level as just being an attentive actor, but it also takes on an entirely new quality the longer you watch it. You begin to get the sense that it's also speaking volumes about the character. When you are a friend or a partner to this kind of person for so long, this behavior develops as an instinctive hybrid of compassion and self-preservation, I think. If you're Nate, you find yourself frequently searching Jim's face for the slightest clue of what might be about to happen next. It's a hard enough thing to do if it's just in the course of caring for your friend, but in a job this dangerous? I get the sense as well that Nate is, at heart, an incredibly gentle person. There's no aggression at any point from him. And patient beyond all reason. And Nikon Robinson is wonderful here. He's also a comedian as well as an actor. And I love the story about how he got involved with this. Jim Cummings just came across him on Instagram and they made friends, basically. And in this role, originally, Jim had hired a celebrity, as he says. I don't know who that was. That ended up falling through. But all through this process, he had been sharing with Nikon the story, the character, the screenplay. And so when the hired actor fell through, Jim called him on the phone and said, what are you doing right now? And he said, I'm returning a shirt at Target. <laughs> so he gets on a plane and comes and does the movie. And thankfully for us, he did. I don't think there's any better encapsulation of their chemistry than this scene where Jim is having his meltdown after the divorce proceedings at the police station. It begins with an argument with Nate that is absurdly funny and heated in equal measure, and we don't see it at first, but there's a move here that finally exposes, for me at least, how grave and unstable his condition truly is. Somewhere in the middle of all this arguing, he has drawn his gun, not even realizing he's done it. We're an eyelash away from real disaster here, it feels like. And it's shown to us in just a moment. We've been watching this kind of mild physical fight, but with real emotions behind it and then just see that and it's not pointed it's down by his side but in that ready position and then we watch him deflate as he realizes how selfish he's been i think my very favorite moment here and i think this supports my idea about he doesn't know when to let his guard down also i think it's something you can appreciate as well i'm making a bit of a joke here but when he says talking about your problems never helped anyone <laughs> ever that's definitely something that I related to. It made me laugh because it was close to home. This is definitely the scene that I found most compelling in that trailer. It's another one of those beautiful long takes that takes us on an emotional roller coaster ride with him. There's the very real danger that he could fatally wound someone that I think he loves. The left field comedy of that off screen, I brought you breakfast, which makes me laugh every time. And then that flicker of horrified realization that plays across his face right before he shouts, this is what you get. And he is screaming at himself as much as he is at them. It's this lashing out and self-flagellation at the same time. That's what I came for. I was seeing myself a little bit in this moment. 
for better or worse. And I knew that you were thinking that, by the way. <laughs> I think the drama of this, though, I, it didn't come from me from worrying about his fate. I never really doubted that he was going to be fine somehow. Maybe I'm projecting there too, just an inordinate amount of confidence in myself that I am projecting onto him. More often than anything, instead, I just caught myself frequently thinking about what it must be like to be in his head, and I'm just fascinated by that. To constantly wonder if the thing that you're saying is the right thing, if it's the thing the person wants to hear, is it what other people say? I think what caught my imagination the most was trying to pin down how he arrives at the things that he thinks are important, the things that catch and hold his attention that he thinks to actually comment on. I'm sorry if I committed a hate crime against you, being one of those things. There's that vacuum cleaner detail after he's lost his daughter that's a great piece of writing. I love the fact that before the divorce proceedings, he's watching a tutorial about practicing his French drop. Shout out to all my magic fans out there. Because it passes by in a second, but I know immediately he's only doing that because he's trying to find one more way to entertain his daughter. I love the moment that he gives to Nike and Robinson in that script. In that same scene where he's talking about the vacuum being full of his daughter's hair, Nate makes that surreptitious call to his own wife and says, We're so lucky, and he believes it. This isn't laughing at his own partner. This is being so grateful for the life that he has. We have that scene where he goes to his mother's grave and he somehow feels it necessary to comment on the tackiness of the other headstones. The creation of this character is a really great feat, I think. To be able to write this seems nearly impossible to me. Because if this is you, then I don't see how you have the self-awareness to document it this accurately. And if it's not you, how do you even conceive of all this? This walking cascade of emotions. I'll tell you what it made me think about. Do you remember... Those little 25 cent Super Balls that you would get out of a vending machine that were guaranteed to bounce forever. Oh, heck yeah, at the hills. I picture all of these impulses bouncing around in his skull like one of these Super Balls that you've thrown as hard as you can in a tiny room just to see how many times it will ricochet. We've mentioned before that comedy is harder to talk about, at least for us. But this particular comedy feels especially difficult. I was struggling before we sat down to record this, feeling like maybe I don't have enough to say because it is just so hard to pin down. Do you think we're accurately putting across how achingly funny it is? I hope we are. I hope so too, because it is. And Jim Cummings has talked about that he is all tone. He doesn't really have a style. He has tone, and that is funny and sad. The two things that make him up. And this whole idea started when he was in a hot tub talking with someone who shared that a friend of theirs sang a song at a parent's funeral. And so he thought, what song would I sing? And it was Thunder Road and how it would be humiliating and sad and funny and weird. All this really is all about Jim Cummings. I believe you theater folk would call this a tour de force. Only he could have done this exact thing. What could easily have seemed like nonsensical tangents and non sequiturs, they all slot very neatly into his chaotic worldview. And it is that very fine line that you referred to just a second ago. This is funny, but it's no joke. Now we're basically at the end of the film, and it is about to get, at least for me, really devastating and incredibly interesting at the same time. He gets pulled over by a fellow police officer, that cop doesn't know why he's been called out, but he needs to answer his phone. Something has happened at his wife's house. He gets there, he goes inside, everything's completely dark, and we see legs. And it's Roz. She's on the couch, her head is thrown back, she's blue. I think one of the most interesting details here is that it was Crystal who called it in. She didn't call him, she called the police. One more indication that his feeling may be right. She's smarter than he is. She makes the right decision. That's obviously the way it should have gone. I don't think calling him first would have done anything except mess things up more. And then he has an exchange, that's the only word I can think of, with his dead wife. She, of course, can't answer back, and so it's an opportunity to say something, to do something. He kisses her hand, and then he slaps her. I don't know how other people are going to take this, if they feel like it's showy, or it's weird, or it's out of character. 
but this is the thing that I can really relate to. I would also want to hit her. I would also want to express myself to anyone who left me before I was ready for them to. Do you think it's more about the leaving or more about the way he feels this is a betrayal of their daughter? Making her see this. Probably in my own selfish way, I think a little bit more of the former. Hmm. But we're also going to learn something really important here in just a second that throws more light on what you said. And that big piece of news we're going to find out is that his mother committed suicide. It's not said like that, but that's the implication. And so this puts so much more focus on everything that's come before and how he acts. And then it does make Roz feel like an even bigger betrayal. Well, Crystal is literally everything he has left now. And this is not the way you want to have to deliver this lesson about life and loss. But he really rises to the occasion, I feel like. I know I've said it already, but I should reiterate. I truly believe there is nothing more important to him than this little girl. When it's just the two of them, it cuts away all the garbage and the pretense. And finally, it pays off on that Thunder Road connection in maybe even a better way than licensing the music for the opening ever could. Now that it's just the two of them, they're going to run away together. They're getting out of this town. Which makes me want to ask, how valid do you find this idea that your problems are somewhat geographical? Because wherever you go, you take your head with you. When I heard people say things like this when I was younger, it was all my friends that were fuck-ups in their early 20s who were fond of over-romanticizing themselves and their circumstances. Does any of this feel like that to you, or is this something different? It does feel like something different here. It feels like it's finally time to make a different decision. And I do understand why my parents left Roanoke, Virginia, even if it was for Idaho. You know, it's not a big metropolis. But they said they had no more opportunities there. So it's legitimately one of those cases that it might be out there, but we know for damn sure it's not here. And definitely they could have stayed and done the same thing, but why would they have wanted to? Is there some sort of glory in that? And I do believe that there are dead-end towns out there. I really like, though, something that Jim Cummings also said. Coming back to the song again. I really wanted to wake people up like Springsteen did. I wanted to encourage people to stop being spectators in their own lives to change if they're unhappy. And I think maybe that also means changing your head, even if it's the same one that you take with you. You don't have to keep telling yourself to stay here, that there's something here for you. So eventually, is that where the redemption lies? Because for all his flaws, he's able to finally at least see past himself and offer this opportunity to his daughter. Is that what we're saying? I do think it comes down to, I'm changing my worldview here and maybe changing himself, hopefully for the better. I do think for the better, rising to the occasion. Well, I sure hope so, because what makes this a must-see, I think, is the universality of his general condition. This is a massively flawed guy trying to do the right thing, but ill-equipped, but that finally gets it right when it is most important, like we all hope we would. I've been thinking about this a lot, too. I think there's something to the idea that he won't go back to being a cop, even in a new place. He won't have that badge and that uniform that puts some legitimacy around this Boy Scout image that he's making and means that to do the right thing, it's all him. There's no other artifice around it. Well, then, the end, I guess. Before the end... The trip to the ballet, that's what really spoke to me, leaning in to see this thing that might just change your life. Well, even though I came into this wrong-headedly, I think, from my best appreciation of it, I'm glad I got to wrestle with it. Maybe that was an advantage now that I think about it. I have to submit myself to it the same way he has to submit himself to these currents and eddies that are moving him around in his life. We're not always going to be able to dictate that based on our conception of a thing. It's always great when a film can confound my expectations. I think this one does it in a way that I can't wait to get back to it and watch it again. How about you? Absolute same for me. I want to watch it with no sound, and then I want to watch it with just the score, if that's possible somehow. Well, I think we've covered why I chose it, basically. I hope it's obvious. It's two primary reasons. To let people know to get in on the ground floor with a really idiosyncratic voice that has the potential to be an enormously satisfying career to follow. 
the tonal register of this film is all its own and it's elusive, which I think is what makes it most appealing to me. One of the greatest things about it, I think, is that it is not trafficking in cringeworthy awkwardness just for the sake of that discomfort. That's an easy thing to do. And I'm not saying that that's not funny. The UK office and Curb Your Enthusiasm, for example, are both favorites, but this is asking something else of us that I think is deeper and more interesting. I hope Jim Cummings gets to make a lot of feature films, and I can't wait to see what he does next. The other reason I chose it is because this film is truly a monument to hustle. My own interest in film really took off with the rise of the American underground in the early 80s, and this feels like a direct descendant of those things. It's heartening that it seems like there's always a group of scrappy kids that sacrifice a lot to make the thing that's important to them. This is the 2018 edition of that, and I will seek out and support those filmmakers until I breathe my last. There is a lot of interesting stuff around the self-distribution model here, so check that out on the web. I'm really inspired by Jim Cummings getting inspired by Mark Duplass. He mentioned at the South by Southwest Festival in 2015 to make the movies you can right now. The cavalry isn't coming. And so he knew if he wasn't going to make this movie, nobody else was. I think also about something that film programmer Kayla Janice said. Even if you build it, they may not come. I know I'll be in the audience. I know you will too. Well, what else do you have for a recommendation for people to be in that audience for? I was inspired by that very singular tone as well. So I chose Bottle Rocket from 1996. Directed by Wes Anderson, with Luke Wilson, Owen Wilson, Robert Musgrave, Lumi Cavazos, and James Kahn. It's about three friends who plan to pull off a simple robbery and then go on the run. I mentioned that singular tone. I chose it for a couple of other reasons as well. Jim Cummings physically reminds me of a Wilson brother, specifically Andrew Wilson. And I think it's easy to forget that with Bottle Rocket, it begins in a really sad place as well. Anthony is getting out of a psychiatric hospital. And lastly, it has its own tone, and the characters in it, Dignan especially, are living in worlds that exist only in their minds, similar to that Boy Scout world in his mind that Jim has created. Plus, it's great fun. It's really funny. It has great music in it, too. And how about you? My recommendation this time is The Foot Fist Way from 2006, and that's directed by Jody Hill and starring Danny McBride, Mary Jane Bostick, and Ben Best. It's about an inept Taekwondo instructor whose personal life is in disarray in spite of the blustery front that he puts up. There are a lot of similarities here that are essentially just a step to the left or right of each other. There's a ton of comedy rooted in discomfort. It's a raging man-child at the center of a tempest of his own making. And maybe most significantly, we're seeing the beginning of something that has great potential. The Foot Fist Way is a little more straightforward in the way it seizes on the awkwardness and the anguish is not as complex. But it's definitely entertaining and worth a watch. Think of it like a cousin to Thunder Road. That cousin that first taught you about listening to Black Sabbath records on huge headphones. So once again, that's two great recommendations, Bottle Rocket and The Foot Fist Way. And that brings us to the end of episode 96. First and foremost, we want to say a special thanks to our brand new Patreon supporters, Mark Peterson and Ian Buckley. We appreciate that very much. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magiclantern. The $5 a month level, for example, gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. I know I'm working on some pioneers of African American cinema and some Miss Marple. And please don't forget to come over to our social media with your votes on which movie you want us to do for episode 100. If you would like to get in touch with us and send us listener questions for that, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. I just wanted to mention quickly, we were lucky enough to be on two of our other favorite shows recently. You were on with our friend Laura Cannon, who does a great show called Fatal Femmes. We talked about 
Woman on the Run from 1950 with Ann Sheridan, and that was great fun. That's episode 12 of that show, and then we were both on with Brett, Nicole, and David over at Movie Go Round, and the Netflix roulette wheel stopped on The Polka King, and we had a really fun time talking with them about that, and that is episode 52 of Movie Go Round. So check that out. And thanks to all of those fine folks for inviting us along. We are on Twitter at Lantern underscore cast. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Grindhouse Dave, Keith Rich, Michael Cannon, Andy Wolverton, Tim Lego, Anthony King, Drew Tavendale and the fine gentleman of Fuds on Film, The Front Porch Swingers, Terry and Liz at Happily Cinemaried, Primo Lamar, Jay McIntyre, Spencer Seams, and the Pod Police. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure and tag us so we can say thanks. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcast, you can find us there. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. Fifth Frame, a listener-supported network celebrating film and culture worldwide.